Oh. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here to present you uh, the work entitled Atomics and Attention Based Architecture for Gnosis and Prognosis from Omics Data. So, one of the goals of uh, personalized medicine is to exploit all available data associated with a patient, such as health records, imaging, and all the omics data that are generated thanks to high throughput methods. And the idea is to go from this data to uh, some prediction, like the treatment adequation to a patient, improving the diagnosis or the prognosis. But to go from this data to the prediction, there is a need of a model. And usually you can use a machine learning model such as a random forest or um, SVM, but if you want to apply this, this kind of models to omics data, there is a need of a feature selection as those, those data, omics data, are highly dimensional. And the problem is that doing a feature selection will limit the capacity of the, of the model to detect hidden interactions between the, the features as it's decoupled from the prediction task. And on the other hand, we have the deep learning approach, which are kind of uh, powerful methods that can adapt any number of features and allow for a high level of abstraction and can uh, do uh, model complex uh, dependencies. And if we look at uh, what architectures has been tested on omics data, um, we, omics data, it's uh, a, a, prof a gen expression profile is a, a vector. There is no particular structure in it. So, MLP or fully connected network are the, the way to go to analyze this kind of data. So the idea is to feed your uh, vector into uh, your network and each layer will construct a new representation and this uh, new representation will ease the prediction, prediction task. And actually in the um, MLP architecture, you can incorporate some knowledge such as the pathway information and the idea is just to link a gene to a specific uh, neuron in your next layer, which represents a pathway. And then I, next hidden layers can uh, detect interaction between pathways. You could also use uh, onto colors to do a self-supervised training and then use your latent space to perform the final uh, prediction. Also inspired by the successes on imaging, CNN has been explored on omics data. So the idea is to order the gene expression profile, uh, either on based on some knowledge or the genome position, and apply one D convolutional window to it. But the problem with the CNN approach is that the interaction we, you will detect are only uh, spe are specific to the convolutional window you are using. You cannot detect long range interaction between your features. And uh, last, uh, widely used architectures is the graph neural networks, as um, in biology, many knowledge can be represented as, as a graph. And you could use a protein-protein interaction graph or a co-expression graph. And in the graph, each node will represent uh, a gene. And when you have the expression vector of a patient, you will map those uh, expression vector onto the graph and perform graph correlational to uh, aggregate the information from neighboring nodes to enrich representation before the final prediction. But this classical deep learning approach has um, have some limits. For instance, for the MLP model, as um, omics data are highly dimensional, more than uh, 10,000 features easily, there is a high number of parameters, but the training data sets are kind of limited, only a few thousand uh, examples. So there is a risk of overfitting. So there is a need to reduce the number of parameters in the architecture. So you could uh, say we just, we can reduce the size of the layers, but by doing this, you have the risk to uh, compress too much your data and lose some information. So there is a need for something else. And the other aspect is that between two patients, uh, gene will not express it in the same way. There is some slight differences on how genes will interact in the level of expression. But with classical deep learning approach, we will fix this interaction by learning them during the, the training. And for uh, the inference, they are fixed. But for a truly personalized medicine, there is a need to have um, interaction that are specific to each patient. 
And this is possible with the attention mechanism. And the idea of the attention mechanism is to, to pick the relevant information from the input data. And this works by um, letting the input element interact with the other element to know what are the other important inputs that will help to enrich the representation. And in practice, the attention is computed as follow. And you can just seeking, think it as a similarity between your inputs. And this is the attention matrix. So it will measure the similarity between the inputs. And I similarity can say that those um, inputs are important each other. And one advantage of using this approach is that you can visualize those interactions. And here is an example of uh, attention matrix in the, for the translation between French and English. And this can give you information, as for instance, here uh, you can see clearly the um, non-adjective inversion between French and English. But the, the main problem of the attention mechanism is, is uh, its complexity, its uh, quadratic complexity, both in space and time. And as I said, omics data are highly dimensional, so we cannot apply this mechanism directly on the omics profile. And the idea was to group related features together and then apply the self-attention mechanism on those groups, which led to the following architecture, the atomics architecture. So we have a grouping module will, uh, which will um, uh, set each features in a specific group, an encoder, in the encoder, each group is projected into a lower dimensional space, and uh, multi self attention is applied and to the set of groups, and then those groups are passed to the predictor. And now I will go in details of the architectures. So let's consider we have a patient, and this patient has these uh, gene expression vectors. We will first assign each feature to a specific group, and this assignment can be done through different strategies. We tested random, clustering strategies to have groups where uh, genes with similar expression pattern are together and groups based on the knowledge, like gene ontology or the hallmarks. But the uh, architecture is quite flexible and can adapt any grouping. You could uh, create unmade groups and use it with architectures. And there is no restriction, so features can belong to one, to more than one groups. Once you have your groups, you will project them into a S space with a fully connected network to learn a new representation. And this representation will consider uh, intergroup interaction. So for instance, in the group, the representation of the group one, consider all the possible interaction from feature from group one, but we created unwanted restriction as features from group one cannot interact with the other groups. But it might, uh, there, there might be some, um, important interaction between groups. So we want to have a way that the group can interact together to restore the information we can extract. And this is thanks to the attention mechanism. And the idea, if we take the, the first group, we'll compute the attention vectors. So the similarity of the group one with the other groups with the uh, following formula. And then we will apply these attention vectors to the set of groups to create the new representation of group one. And we apply this to all the groups. And now we have a in, intra and intergroup interaction. So we have the, a rich representation for each groups. And then for the end of, of the architecture, we use the residual connection to uh, prevent from vanishing gradients during the training. We normalize each groups and then we concatenate back together all the groups together in one single vectors and pass them to the predictors to get the final prediction. And the um, atomics architecture was trained on TCGA data with a weighted cross entropy to account for the class imbalance. And we tested uh, different models. So the atomics architecture in green, uh, CNN in red, in blue, we have uh, graph neural networks and in black, the MLP. And we tested on three different omics, methylation, gene expression, and mRNA data. And we compare the performances of the model with uh, the error rate. And one thing you can see is that the CNN is the worst performing model across all modalities. And this is likely due to 
uh, what I said in the beginning is that there is too much restriction in your convolutional window to extract sufficient information from the gene expression or the omics profile. And now if we look for the um, methylation data, we can see that uh, atomics can perform better or similarly to other uh, deep learning architectures such as MLP or GNN. And there is no impact of the grouping strategy. So the random and clustering approach performs similarly. For the gene expression data, so uh, atomics architectures can perform better or similarly to other uh, deep learning architecture with uh, no attention in it. But if we compare then the um, grouping strategy, we can see an impact. So random and uh, gene ontology are the ones that perform the best with the lower error rate. And the clustering approach has a slightly uh, higher error rate. And the gene ontology one is uh, the worst of the four uh, grouping strategies. And in real world uh, scenario, uh, the um, uh, size of the, the available uh, training set are quite limited and not as large as the TCGA data set. So we tested to train all the different architectures under uh, limit, uh, limited training uh, set. And we compare the performances. And we can see that for uh, methylation on mRNA, uh, atomics is the one performing the best, especially under low training uh, uh, size, and this is probably due to the fact that using the attention, we're reducing uh, significantly the number of parameters in the model. For instance, uh, we can project in a uh, high, uh, high space, large space with less parameters than uh, MLP. And there is something important to notice that it's the random uh, grouping strategy can perform better than a strategy based on the current knowledge. And the question is what uh, grouping strategy we should use because using the biologic based one, we can uh, have more information as we can visualize the attention map, but the random one can perform better. And it's a trade-off between what you want, best performances or better interpretability of your model. And if we look, uh, as at the attention map uh, using uh, knowledge, biologically knowledge aware groups, we can see there is uh, important differences between each cancers. So here, each attention map is the mean attention map between patients with the same cancer. And we can see there is specific uh, interaction that are um, detected by the model for each cancer. So the model is really learning uh, specific interaction to each uh, cancer. And if we focus on one cancer, for instance, the uh, cervical cancer, uh, we identified a different pathway that are involved in the promotion of the cervical cancer. So for instance, the uh, interleukin-6 uh, JAK state 3 signaling, and also the edge hog signaling and the wing signaling. And which is really interesting is uh, the interaction between uh, wind and edge hog uh, pathways, because the crosstalk between these two pathways is known to be involved in chemo-resistant uh, uh, cervical cancer, and this interaction is uh, detected by the model and considered as important. And now we see that we can use different sources of knowledge, and I want to compare the different sources of knowledge if they can provide the same information with the model. and. We, we, on the left, we have the gene ontology, and on the right, the all marks. And this is for the bladder cancer. And for each cancer, we detected, uh, for each uh, strategy, we detected the role of inflammatory response as important. And this is really interesting, is that the, the model is able to, to capture the important interaction as the inflammatory response is known to be involved uh, in the bladder cancer even when using different sources of knowledge. And uh, so applying self-attention on high dimensional vectors such as the omics profile is really challenging as the self-attention memory requirement scales quite likely with a number of elements. And we find a way to, to get past this by grouping similar features together. 
which led to an architecture with less parameters uh, can achieve similar or better performances than other deep learning uh, approaches. And using the self-attention, we are able to capture uh, specific uh, interactions specific to each patient. And even uh, with limited training database, we can achieve better performances than other deep learning methods. And now each omics were studied uh, individually, but in reality, we, we know that all these omics are intertwined in common um, pathways. So uh, the next step would be to, to consider the interaction between this all omics to exploit the complementary information and the redundancy, redundancy between the omics to improve uh, even more the performances of the network. Thank you. Okay, uh, any questions? Uh, you can come to the front. Um, while people are thinking, uh, it's not, it's, so I think you were saying that the random grouping performed as well in the benchmark. Yes. Um, so what do the attention maps look like for the random case? Are they much more sort of uh, spread out and less? Yeah, they're, and, they're much more uh, balanced, sorry, between the uh, interaction between groups. Yeah. It's more like all the groups interact together and are important at the beginning. And when you go deeper in the network, they are more um, focused on some um, specific groups. Okay, so it seems to be providing some sort of regularization, or is it just because you can't scale it up? Like, I mean, is the reason to do the grouping only because it's not scalable to do the yes. individual? But um, how does performance, did you look at how performance uh, changes as the group size changes? Uh, how how, how yes. does the impact? So there is a range where there is no impact. Uh, so for a few hundreds, uh, the group size groups, uh, there is no impact. But if you go to larger groups, then the performance start to degrade. I see. OK. Ah. So uh, you asked my question. <laughs> So I was thinking other questions. So uh, very nice, uh, very nice presentation. Interesting talk. So you said uh, combining different omics is the future work, right? That's yes. something that I was going to ask. Um, so here there's two level of attention. The first one is intergroup attention. Did you also look into that? Are there some gene pairs or features that have high attention between itself? Uh, no, I didn't look at it because. Uh, for the intra groups, we used uh, classical uh, fully connected networks. So there is, we would need uh, some uh, attribution methods after the training to see what are the important genes. And it could be difficult to track the important genes, uh, especially when you, you do multiple layers of attention. So because in your first layer, you are really measuring one to one interaction, and in the next layer, you are measuring to pair interaction and then triple, triplets and so on. It's, so it's complicated to track really what are the important genes, but uh, it's something that is, can be explored. Okay, one uh, quick question also uh, in terms of, uh, so you did cancer type prediction. Did you look into other downstream tasks? Yeah, we tried uh, survival prediction. And it's actually a really difficult task so we only had a, a small improvement, but not as much as the cancer type prediction. Okay, there's a question in the uh, online, which was, what was your strategy for doing clustering? Um, did you do it using all the data? Is there danger of data information yeah, for, leakage? Uh, for the clustering, we used um, a constrained k-means clustering because uh, we, want, we wanted groups to have similar sizes. And if using classical clustering, we would end up with uh, one big group and small groups. So this would create an imbalance in the network and the network will focus on the big groups only which, where there is much information. And only with the training data. Yes, only training data. I have a quick question on the model architecture. The, so did you try, one question first, was this parameter size of the model compared to the other ones you tried, the more benchmarking models? And two, um, did you try other attention mechanisms um, 
did you uh, try like mass self attention or did you just stick with like discontinuous masking? Uh, no, we did not try uh, another attention mechanism. And for the size of the network, so uh, MLP is the largest one, a uh, few hundreds million of parameters. Uh, CNN is really small, uh, a few million of parameters. GNN also. And Atomix is in between. Uh, like uh, it depends on the omics, but you can have uh, only 100 uh, million parameters. Thanks. Uh, there was another question online about whether you're using one attention head or whether you uh, whether it'd be useful to use multiple. Yeah. So we tried uh, one and multiple attention heads, and actually we noticed that there is no impact on using multiple heads. So for the sake of simplicity, we only used one head, one head. Okay, thanks. I, 